So uh, welcome back, everybody. We are going to explore a subject that is a continuation from some of the themes that were explored in the previous lecture. So I think it's a nice continuity. And um, we will see this idea of divine darkness and how it was it is interpreted in terms of a mystical approach. The idea of darkness is there in all mystical traditions or the, the mystical aspect of all religions. Um, I'm going to present some examples from the theosophical literature and also from the Christian tradition. Um, but we can find this, in, as I said, in many others. I don't know, in Buddhism, there is this idea of the uh, dark meditation. Uh, in Judaism, there is this quote, for example, Adonai has chosen to dwell in thick darkness. Adonai is the name of God. Uh, in Hinduism, we have the Asampranyata Samadhi, for example, um, which means union without cognition beyond cognition, beyond thoughts, beyond knowledge, similar to what Christian mystics talk about when they, they mention the cloud of unknowing. So we will see um, some excerpts from these two traditions, Theosophical and Christian, but these are not exclusive to them. So let's see first this idea of darkness in Theosophical literature. Um, in my previous talk, I mentioned a little about the idea that darkness is the real and light is a temporary reflection of the real. So Blavatsky says, darkness is, one, is the one true actuality, the basis at the root of light, without which the latter could never manifest itself, not even exist. Darkness, in its radical metaphysical basis, is subjective and absolute light. Remember, I said that light, per se, is not brilliant or radiant. It becomes radiant when it bounces off some object. So in its essence, light is also dark. While the latter, light, in all its seeming effulgence and glory, is merely a mass of shadows, as it can never be eternal and is simply an illusion. So light, from a mystical point of view, and we are going to see that, is presented as a shadow, as a, an illusion, because it is not eternal. I mentioned this also in, in my previous lecture, that in the universe, light has to be actively produced by a star, for example, um, it has to be artificially created, artificially in, in the sense that uh, it's, it's not something that is the default state of the universe. Uh, the nature of the universe is darkness, and light is something that is created, lasts for a while, and then things go back to darkness. Now, we normally uh, associate darkness with death, with uh, unconsciousness, uh, with evil, but this is only because we have perhaps a bias for the kind of consciousness we know. And we are attached to the kind of consciousness we know. But every mystic says there is another, call it consciousness, a non-consciousness, uh, which is far more real than what we know. And uh, from that perspective, the idea of darkness is transformed. Uh, is not the darkness of the emptiness as we know it. And we will see some of this. So Blavatsky says, when the whole universe returns to its primordial, one primordial element, there is neither center of luminosity nor eye to perceive light, and darkness necessarily fills the boundless all. Now this is also the psychological experience. When we are present in our normal consciousness, there is an I to perceive. That I implies my I as opposed to the rest. I see the rest that is separate away from me. But there are states of consciousness in which my sense of separation can disappear 
And then there is something else there, which is a unity, in which we are and yet we are not. In the spiritual sense, Blavatsky says, darkness is not the absence of light, but the one incomprehensible primordial principle, the, the essence of everything in the universe, including ourselves, this primordial principle is what we call darkness. She says, being absoluteness itself has for our intellectual perceptions neither form, color, substantiality, nor anything that could be expressed by words. So you, you can begin to see that one of the reasons why we talk about darkness in terms of the essence of things is because to our intellect, which is used to perceive concrete, separate entities, this is something that has no form. Because a form is a limitation. Something that has a form is right here and not there. But the, the divine principle, if it is omnipresent, it cannot be contained in any particular It cannot be of any particular color. If you say, say the one principle is blue, that means it is not red. But if the one principle is the whole, then you cannot define it with any of the qualities that pertain to the fragments, to the separation. So for when we try to contemplate this divine principle with our intellect, it is just darkness. It is formless. So she continues, it is darkness more un most unquestionably to our intellect, inasmuch as we can know nothing of it. Neither darkness nor light are to be used in the sense of opposites as in the differentiated world. So this, this is emphasizing the fact that darkness is because it's unknown, unknown to our intellect. So the question is, if it is something that we cannot perceive, is it beyond us? Is it useless to talk about it? Normally, there is, the, there is a tendency to look at things in this way, even in modern philosophy, where there is the postulate that the, the essences, the noumenon, if it exists, is beyond our perception altogether. Therefore, why are we postulating that there is something that we can never know? But the, the limitation in this approach is, is based in the fact that there is a lack of self-knowledge in our modern culture because we think that our faculties end with our intellect. So if something is not attainable by the intellect, then by definition it is beyond ourselves. Now, all mystical traditions postulate that there is a higher source of perception, a higher organ, if we want to call it. And this is something that, so far, only the spiritual traditions are taking into account. Science, regular psychology, uh, philosophy, limit themselves to what is perceptible, to what is uh, known, understood, and leave all these other very important aspects of human beings aside. So I think there is a, an enormous value in the spiritual traditions when we come to these aspects that are beyond the reach of science. We are in love with science and technology in our culture. Science is perhaps the new god, uh, but it's a very limited god, perhaps like the god of the Gnostics. You know, very limited, very concrete, just tied to the physical universe that is far more behind. So Blavatsky says, the occultist, the Rose Croix, the Rosicrucians of the Middle Ages, and even the medieval Kabbalists said that to our human perception, and even to that of the highest angels, the universal deity is darkness. And from this darkness issues the Logos. The Logos is, the, as, as we discussed briefly in the previous talk, we can think of the Logos as, as the, the knowable deity, the source of intelligence, the source of wisdom, the world, as it was translated uh, by John in, in one of the Gospels. And then she says, if the absolute deity can be referred to as darkness 
or the dark fire, the light, its first progeny, is truly the, self, the first self-conscious God. So the idea is that there is this absolute darkness, the source of the conscious God. In most religions, we relate to God as a conscious entity. By conscious, I mean an entity that shares similar attributes to ours. God is love. Uh, depending on the tradition, God may get angry. Um, God is this or that. And these are all human attributes. Mystics find this description of God OK, but limited. This is our perception of God, but there is something beyond that. And that, for example, in the Christian tradition, they developed this idea of the Godhead or the Godhood that is a more abstract aspect of God, which is the ground or the essence of all these manifested qualities. And therefore, it's beyond consciousness. Why? Because, as Blavatsky says here, consciousness implies limitations and qualifications. Something out there, the object, to be conscious of, and someone, myself, yourself, the subject, to be conscious of it. So there is a duality in consciousness. But absolute consciousness contains, contains the cognizer, the thing cognized, and the cognition. The knower, the known, and the knowledge. All three in itself, and all three in one. This is a kind of perception that we don't know. If our perception is limited to our intellect, our senses, our psyche, the emotions, the mind, uh, we, we don't know about this, this kind of conscious non-consciousness. Therefore, when we try to figure out this idea of the divine, uh, either we interpret it in terms of separation the divine separated from the creation, myself separated from the divine. Uh, or we can hold the idea that there is a state that transcends the normal um, concept that we have about me perceiving something else. And this is the mystical search, the search for that, that state in which we transcend duality. So let's see how some Christian mystics talked about this idea. A famous, perhaps one of the first uh, Christian mystics to work on this was Dionysius the Areopagite. Now the, the scholars say that this person who wrote this book, for example, the mystical theology, cannot be Dionysius, who I think was um, a disciple of Paul. So they call, call him pseudo Dionysius. In any case, I'm sure that pseudo Dionysius was far more brilliant than the true Dionysius, but you know, now we call him pseudo Dionysius. And he says, the pure, absolute, and immutable mysteries. You know, mysteries comes from the root, the same root as the word the, a mist, a mist, a cloud. These things that we cannot quite perceive. So the pure and absolute and immutable, eternal mysteries of theology, of the knowledge of God, are veiled in the dazzling obscurity of the secret science. So you see, he talks, uh, most mystics use paradoxes. So dazzling obscurity of the secret silence. Outshining all brilliance, this darkness is more brilliant than all brilliant, brilliance with the intensity of their darkness and start charging our blinded intellects with the utterly impalpable and invisible fairness of glories surpassing all beauty. Imagine the most beautiful thing, the most beautiful image of God. There is a brilliant darkness that surpasses that. And mystics many times use this flowery language because they are trying to express that state by means of words that pers per se are very cold, very uh, limited. So he says, the beneficent cause reveals himself in his naked truth to those alone who, leaving behind them all divine light and sound and heavenly utterances, plunge into the darkness where truly dwells, 
as the oracles declare, that one who is beyond all. So he's talking about things that many religious people, uh, let's say, crave for, divine light and sound, heavenly utterances, to be in touch with God, but by means of a sensorial relationship, whether the senses are physical or psychic, there are some mystics that are visionaries, and they have these visions, but there are some mystics that go even beyond the visions. They say there is something that is beyond images, beyond uh, senses, beyond the intellect. And this is where the true deity lies. All the visions are the shadow of the true deity in the view of these kind of mystics. The mystic, he says, plunges into the darkness of unknowing, whence all perfection of understanding is, is excluded. So one theme in the mystics is to go beyond understanding. But see that he says perfection of understanding. Going beyond the understanding is not refusing understanding, going back into non-understanding. They are talking about a transmental state, not a pre-mental state. One problem I think is quite prevalent in modern spirituality is that recognizing that the mind is limited, there is a tendency to go back to the instinctual, to the impulsive, calling it spontaneous. You know, it's far easier to go back than to go through and beyond. But when you see the mystics, I even in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, there is this idea of the non-cognitive uh, unions. But the idea is to, to uh, develop the cognitive aspect uh, uh, to, the, to the perfection that is, it is available to provide, and then going beyond. So he says, dwelling uh, plunges in the darkness that is uh, beyond the perfection of understanding, where, where all that is excluded, and he is enwrapped in that which is altogether intangible and noumenal. Noumenal is the essences of which we only see appearances. So he says, being wholly absorbed in him who is beyond all, and through the inactivity of all his reasoning powers, see, by uh, leaving behind all the reasoning powers, the mystic is united by his highest faculty to him who is holy and knowable. So there is a highest faculty that is beyond the reasoning powers. Thus, by knowing nothing, he knows that which is beyond knowledge. So this is clear here that there is a faculty of which science knows nothing about Philosophy, modern philosophy in the West knows little about. Uh, the, the trend, unfortunately, today is to move away from metaphysics, to, to put philosophy at the service of science. And I think that it's OK, philosophy can help science, but philosophy is, is losing its natural place, which is trying to grasp the metaphysical aspects of of uh, the world. Uh, so there is this faculty that is not really explored. Of course, there are some branches in philosophy, psychology, that try to explore transpersonal realities, but they are not prevalent. So it is by the mystical approach that we can get in touch with this. What is this highest faculty? Well, Blavatsky says, every one of us possesses the faculty, the interior sense, known as intuition. You know, the word intuition is more or less uh, means the interior sense. Intuition is a knowledge that doesn't come through the mind. So many times in philosophy, intuition is a sensorial perception. Before the mind puts a concept on what we are perceiving. What the, the senses bring is an intuition, and then the mind conceptualizes it. But there are different levels of intuition. A hunch is a form of intuition. It's not something that we worked out by thinking about it. But that, in the theosophical view, is more of a psychic intuition. And the intuition may be wrong, may be right, and it's still normally about information of the world. But Blavatsky says there is a spiritual intuition, as we are going to see 
that direct perception which alone can show us the essence of something, and that is the, what is a faculty that is higher to, than the mind. So there is this intuition, but how rare are those who know how to develop it? It is, however, the only faculty by means of which men and things are seen in their true colors. It is an instinct, instinct of the soul, which grows in us in proportion to the use we make of it. You see many times, in, even in phenomenology, in philosophy, where the idea is to explore the experience, um, most philosophers don't have access to this faculty because we are not taught how to develop it. So the field of experience that, that uh, philosophy and science and psychology, as I keep repeating, the field of experience that they have access to is limited because we don't train ourselves to explore this. And then when a mystic comes and talks about this other field, they interpret it because they cannot perceive it, they interpret it as hallucination or a psychological memory of when we were in the womb or things like that. Uh, but there is a faculty which is available if we develop it. So she says, grows in us in proportion to the use we make of it and which help us to perceive and understand real and absolute facts with far more certainty that than can the simple use of our senses and the exercise of our reason. So coming back to Pseudo Dionysius, he gives a hint as to how to work towards this perception. And he says, we ascend from the particular to the universal conceptions. So we start from what the senses can bring, but we, can go, we want to go beyond the perception of the senses. So how do we proceed? He says, abstracting all attributes. This is the via negativa in, in the true sense, in the original sense, the mystical sense, via negativa, is the idea of letting go any attribute that is limited. For example, um, is God this? If God is this, it means it is not the opposite. Therefore, we cannot postulate that God, God is everywhere. Most mystics regard God or the divine as being omnipresent. So any qualification is limited. So the mystic begins to work on this by trying to perceive what is left when we leave behind all the limitations, all qualities, all temporary aspects. And he says, so abstract, get rid of all attributes in order that without veil, we may know that unknowing which is, which is enshrouded under all that is known and all that can be known and that we may begin to contemplate the super essential, that which is even beyond essences, the super essential darkness, which is hidden by all the light that is in existing things. So you see, he says, the light is he hiding the darkness. Existence is hiding, hiding the essence. Even the attributes of God are hiding the super essential God. In the Cloud of Unknowing, another mystical text that we are going to see a couple of quotes, he says, the a Christian monk says, it is okay to praise God uh, his love and his mercy and uh, to have all these attitudes. But what I'm teaching is something that goes beyond. Don't, don't tell this to anybody else. Keep it secret because it, it was quite dangerous, but also because it can be misinterpreted. A lot of the problems we see in modern spirituality with abuse of power, uh, with um, you know, things that were talked in, in, in the talk uh, last night, are because, I think, people who are not yet mature are coming to teachings that are not meant for that level of maturity. Today we want everything to be available. Why do you keep this secret? I want to, I want to have access to it. 
But there are certain approaches that we need the, the maturity necessary to take them in the right way. So we have immature pseudo-gurus teaching immature audiences, and then we have all these kind of troubles. So these things were kept secret and given to those who had gone first through the traditional approach to religion. That is very important. That is necessary. Uh, the problem with religion is when they say this stage is the only one that, that helps, that is true, and all the rest is a lie. But if religion is not exclusive, we can see how all conceptions of God are necessary. And if we can give the, the freedom to people to choose the highest conception that they are able to, to, to hold, religion will always help people. Uh, if we put a, an ideal that is too far from the grasp of people, that ideal is not going to inspire people to be better, to do the right thing, to, to love each other. We need to give people the ideal that is attainable by to them. But then there are many that need something else. So these monks normally would teach this to those people that they saw that had the maturity, enough maturity for this. So the idea here is that light attributes uh, hide the darkness and the essences. And I think this is partly why Blavatsky says, light is matter and darkness pure spirit. Now, this was said in the, at the end of the 19th century when we didn't know anything about quantum physics. And scientists thought that light was pure energy as something completely different from matter. Today, we know that light is matter, the photons and all the subatomic particles. Um, so even from a physical point of view, this is true. But again, we are in love with light, which is the perceptible. And we tend to refuse the dark which is beyond the perceptible. And uh, in the mystical quest, we have to start falling in love with darkness. Uh, not in the, sense of, in the sense of evil, of course, but that which is beyond, with silence, as opposed to you know, excitement, constant stimuli. So Pseudo Dionysius said, when plunging into the darkness, which is above the intellect, we pass not merely into brevity of speech, into silence, or, or into few words, but even into absolute silence of thoughts as well as of words. So the direction is going into, into that direction of silence, not only of the tongue, but also silence of thoughts. So the Cloud of Unknowing that was written by a Christian monk influenced by uh, Pseudo Dionysius, we don't know who he was, he writes to a student and he says, the first time you do this, you will experience a darkness, as it were a cloud of unknowing. You will know nothing except the feeling of a naked intent reaching out towards God. So you leave behind everything you, you know. Uh, he says, put it in the cloud of forgetting. Forget about God, everything you learn, the attributes. Forget about your, your spiritual life, how you are. Forget about everything. And just stay in this silence, in this state of not knowing, only with the yearning to, to, to reach God, to reach the divine. And he says, when I say darkness, I mean a lack of knowing, as with those things that are unknown to you. We have to start with the idea that we don't know the divine. Instead of projecting our image onto the divine, let us start with the idea we don't know the divine. We have to, to, to find it, not find it according to my beliefs. Again, beliefs are perfectly fine, but in the mystical search, we leave them, we suspend them. In, in phenomenology, sometimes they say, bracket them out. You know, for the time being, suspend all your beliefs, all your knowledge. Don't think that what you are going to find is something that you will recognize. Because then you are only working with your own projections. Just leave all behind. 
He says, what obscures God from you is not a cloud in the sky, but this cloud of unknowing. Abide in this darkness as long as you can. Any insight you ever gain of God will be in this cloud and in this darkness. So the instruction is abide in the darkness. As Adonai that has chosen to dwell in thick darkness, that is where we can find the divine. So we have to train ourselves to learn how to abide in the darkness. And for this, there are quite a few instructions in theosophical literature about abiding in the darkness and how we can do this. So in her, in her language that is many times obscure and metaphorical, Blavatsky says the student should fix the fourfold consciousness. By that, she means thoughts, emotions, the, the sense of vitality, and the sen physical sensations. Fix your personal consciousness on a higher plane and nail it there. Uh, let the student make a bundle of all these different um, you know, activities of consciousness and pin them to a higher state. He should center on this higher, trying not to permit the body and intellect to draw him down and carry him away. So in meditation, the idea is try to reach the highest state and stay there. Memories will come, sensations will come, craving for your attention. Just notice them, let them go, and focus again in the darkness and the silence, as when you are trying to listen to something that is very subtle. If I say, right now, there is a, a, a bird singing right now. Can you hear it? So what is your attitude? You stop and pay attention, waiting for that to come to you. That is more or less the attitude. Stop and pay attention, waiting for something to come. Now, Wani Besant recommended, she said that it's far easier to do this after you work with your intellect. So she says, in meditation, practice any technique of meditation you want. Uh, you may think of the divine, visualize the divine, uh, pay attention to sensations or to anything. And gradually, the, the mind that is constantly going all over the, the place steady by this process in meditation of slow and gradual curbing, and at last, you are fixed on the central thought or the central figure or the object of meditation. And there, you are poised. When you are in that state, let it go. Now let even that go. Drop the central thought, the idea, the seed of meditation. Let everything go. But keep the mind in the position gained, the highest point reached, vigorous and alert, not a mind that is dreamy, that is uh, uh, a dull mind. The mind that is, that is alert, waiting for what may come. Remain poised and wait in the silence and the void. You are in the cloud that is described in the Christian mysticism. Another quote by her, then when you have worked up to your highest point of reasoning in meditation and reached the last link, link of your chain of argument, this is using the technique of inside meditation, trying to, to realize a spiritual truth. Once you use your mind to its best ability, and your mind will carry you no further, and beyond that you can see nothing, then stop. At the highest point of thinking, cling desperately to the last link of the chain, and there keep the mind poised in steadiness and strenuous quiet, waiting for what may come. After a while, you will be able to maintain this attitude for a considerable time. When you try it at first, you may be in that silence for one second, two seconds. But if we train ourselves in this, if we don't end our meditation with the technique, we end the meditation with transcending the technique. Little by little, we learn to stay in the formless world. She says, there is no objection to any of you who are accustomed to meditation in trying this. This is not something da dangerous. 
provided that you can remember to stop the moment you feel a little bit tired. If you are really doing it, you feel tired in a moment. Then there is a temptation to go on further. But don't try to do, don't try to do it too vigorously for the first time because it tends to bring, a, bring about a headache. It is better not to persist against that. A headache means that you are straining the nervous mechanism of the brain, which you must not do. And you will see that it's, it's not easy to hold this consciousness there. And if you are trained in meditation, you can push it. And then you start feeling like a pressure first in the brain, like a little pressure. And then it may develop into a headache. So Besson says the, the body has its own rhythm. It has a certain inertia. You cannot push too far. It's just like a crooked tree. If you bend, try to unbend it too, too fast, you will break it. So you have to be patient. And she says, as long as you are careful, this is perfectly fine. This is not the empty mind where a person just sits, opens up the mind for whatever to come, falling into a state of unconsciousness. This is transcending cognition, being in this very alert mind. In Buddhism, they talk about the clarity of mind, keeping the clarity of mind, keeping full consciousness, as we are going to see. And she says, the term cloud is very often used in mystical literature of the West. You feel as though surrounded by a dense mist. Be still, be patient, wait. Let your consciousness be in the attitude of suspense, when you are suspending judgment, suspending activity. Presently, the cloud will thin, and first in glimpses, then in its full beauty, the vision of a higher plane will dawn on your entranced sight. In that darkness, a light shall be seen, the glory of the self. The cloud shall vanish, and the shining of the self shall be made manifest. So the idea in the mystical approach is dwell in the darkness, and at some point, the divine will be revealed. You see, in many movies, there is this idea that the aspirant goes to a temple, knocks at the door, nobody opens, and either he gives up and leaves, or he sits there for one day, two days, three days, until the door is open. And that was the test. How much do you want to come into the temple? So this darkness and silence is, can be seen as the test. How much do you want the divine? Can you stay here? Or you say, oh, this is too boring. I'll go back to impressions, stimulation. But it's also in the darkness that we are in the presence of the divine. You can think of the darkness and silence as being kneeling in front of the divine. Remember, God dwells in the silence, in the darkness. And it will reveal itself to you when the divine decides to do it. And she says, and Ibesan says, the passing to a higher condition of consciousness is always preceded by, by what seems like an extinction of consciousness. That is, we lose what we have. We lose all the distinctions and, and the differences and the limitations which are our consciousness. These go, and we are obliged to have the courage to let the whole of those go. I have heard many times people saying that at some point in meditation, they felt that they were disappearing, and they become afraid, and they felt that they needed to ground themselves. And all that is a, is a reaction from the personal self that is being dissolved, and there is the fear from the personal self. And if we don't know that that is OK, then we cling to the personal self and don't allow ourselves to be in that darkness. So we need to know that the personal self has to disappear. One problem with modern meditation is that it's, it's advertised as something you do so that you can get things. Uh, it, the same with prayer. You know, we grew up thinking, OK, prayer is to ask God for all the things that we want. Let my soccer team win. And God must be French because Argentina didn't win the World Cup. <laughs> and uh, let, you know, I want this. I want that. Um, but the, the true meditation, or let's say the, the, the real, really spiritual meditation implies that we have to surrender. 
Not surrender our awareness, we will see that. We have to surrender our self-identity, our identification, our desires. As long as we cling to that, to that, we are not in the cloud of unknowing. We are clinging to the known. So she says um, that we need to have courage to let all those things go and we seem to be sinking in a condition of practical annihilation. That is the great act of faith, to let it all go, to throw ourselves off what seems to us the rock of certainty into what seems to be the whirlpool of uncertainty that awaits us. So we need that attitude of faith, as she says, let everything go. The real can never be destroyed. Anything that can be destroyed, anything that can disappear is the unreal. So let everything go and let the real shine. Now this doesn't imply unconsciousness. What we, we go into a state that Blavatsky calls conscious non-consciousness. You are there and yet you are not cognizing yourself as a separate entity. These things cannot really be expressed with words, but uh, you, it's like if you were aware in deep sleep. In deep sleep, there is no images, no sounds, nothing. Um, and yet we are there in nothingness. We don't think about ourselves. We don't think about the pass of time. Uh, we don't think about anything, but there is a presence there. So this extinction of consciousness that Annie Besant talks about is the extinction of the dualistic consciousness that we know. So Ledbetter, who was a colleague of Annie Besant, and the two of them, Ledbetter and Besant, wrote about meditation, this, the, the higher aspects of meditation, in a way that you know, I, I, I have researched a lot of mysticism and all that. And in the past, things were hinted at. Maybe modern teachers of different traditions are, are teaching this to their disciples. But it's not very easy to find publicly um, more detailed explanations of how to do it. And I found it, Besa and Ledbetter, very uh, interesting hints. So he says, our ideal is perfect consciousness on the highest level we can reach. We do not propo propose to rest satisfied at any level, whatever. So we want to. Uh, attain a higher perception, but we decline to give up our consciousness and go into a trance, as some people do for the purpose of reaching a level beyond the scope of their waking consciousness. It is useless to get beyond the point where one can be conscious, from which one emerges with all sorts of glorified and beautiful feelings, but not generally with clear consciousness. So in meditation, we can learn how to leave behind our waking consciousness, go into a trance where we are not aware. Maybe hours may pass, and then we come back to awareness with some feeling of exaltation, but no clue of what happened. And let be, let be there and Besan, they said, this is not really useful. It's not too different from falling asleep. When we, when we go to sleep, we lose awareness, we are on higher planes, we come back and we don't remember. The trances are more or less similar. He says we should always try to get to the highest without losing the purest of self-awareness. He says this does not mean process, progress to go into a trance. Our method is to keep full consciousness on any plane that we can reach. And he says I know that many have passed into samadhi and have experienced a great feeling of happiness and beatitude. Uh, you know, sometimes samadhi is interpreted as a trance. I think this is why in, in some schools of Buddhism, they are against the idea of going into samadhi. Um, samadhi as this going into a trance, losing the clarity of mind. So here, he again says that, however, does not mean progress. This is a different quote, because they lose hold and do not know clearly what they have been doing or what the state they were in, our method is to keep full consciousness on any plane we can reach. So in meditation, you try to go to the silence, to the, the, the 
the darkness, but keeping your full self-awareness. Not mental awareness. That is the awareness that is, hold, uh, that is held uh, through thinking. It's the sense of presence. You know clearly that you are present, and yet you are not thinking of yourself, of your object of meditation, or anything else. There is just unity of presence. Seeing I have the microphone in my hand, I get to ask the very first question, mm -hmm. which I very rarely do, Pablo. Mm -hmm. I yeah. greatly enjoy the presentation, as with most of them, and I also find them really inspiring and uplifting and you know, really inspiring in a way that would lead to wanting to do more practice. My only question, um, and, and, and you know, please forgive me for asking it, mm -hmm. is that a lot of what is being said here, um, and the quotes especially from theosophical literature, is um, poetic and I feel really pointing in a very good direction. But uh, I'm always uh, perplexed as to why there was a whole tradition of very systematic, very clear presentation of the process of refinement of mind through the practice of meditation that had been well established, um, certainly in Buddhism, mm -hmm. which explains this process extremely precisely and mm -hmm. clearly and, uh, you know, within the path of mind training and developing of uh, states of refinement. A and why there is so little reference of that, such a clear presentation, explanation. It's almost like a perfect description of the path, and yet we have to resort to rather poetic descriptions. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing is that the Buddhist texts were not available when Blavatsky and Besan were, were writing. And the other is that Besan says in one, one of her quotes that I didn't bring, uh, and Krishnamurti made a lot, a lot of emphasis on that, she said, all these things, if you explain them too much, it may, it may tend to get people uh, working on the, staying on the conceptual level. You know, when Krishnamurti was dissolving the order of the star, he said, I could say all these things very clearly, but I want to be purposefully vague because I want you to go to the unknown. So what I see that in the theosophical literature they do is to explain how to get there and then stop there. And um, in, you know, in, as I said, in the inner traditions of each, each religion, that is available because the teachers have had an experience in this. They explain to the, to the meditators how to, to do this. But then when all this comes to the West, what do we know? Just watch your breathing, uh, chant this mantra. Uh, even in, with the Yoga Sutras, I, ha I have talked to some Swamis that have come here to give classes and uh, about sa the Samadhi and Asampranyata. And there seems to be no real um, um, you know, technique. I don't know if they don't want to give it, and they may be, that may be part of it. So I think there are these two things, that there is a, a training that was kept in the traditions that is normally not given publicly. Now everything is being translated and published, you know, uh, uh, texts from the Yogacara tradition, texts from Tibetan Buddhism, the Pali texts uh, in Buddhism. But when, and even 10 years ago when, you know, I was trying to learn meditation, uh, all those things were very difficult to, to, um, to get a hand of. So uh, I think that there are these two things. The texts were unknown, and also in the theosophical approach, there is the idea of explain only so far so that there is not too much conditioning. And Besan says, um, this is just like, like um, whatever else you want to do, you will know what to do when you try to do it. So I think they give some hints, and I have followed this, and, and you get the handle of it. You say, uh, for example, Be uh, Leadbeater says, the attitude is like pushing upwards. That's all you know. So you see it, you go through meditation, and then you have this, like, this sense that you are pushing upward with your awareness, trying to go, and it does work. Uh, you know, 
you, when you try, you start realizing how it works. Uh, so that's all I could think. Uh, in Buddhism, in particular, there, there are they were always very systematic in describing, you know, the ten this, the fifteen that, and the, and there was a, and I'm sure that that also works. I, I just I'm just sharing, you know, what the theosophical approach is. But you have experience in the meditation with that tradition, so. Yeah. Um, it seems the way you express things based on the, what Blavatsky has written and what ha how things have been presented in theosophical lit lit literature in general, does it seem, or it seems to me, maybe I'm wrong, that there are two kinds of darkness, mm -hmm. divine darkness, in the sense that, in one sense, when we talk about darkness, it is always unknowable, always it will rest darkness. Even the highest spirits, mm -hmm. even the highest beings, as mm -hmm. it is said, the bara nobody will never know Bara Brahman. It will, mm -hmm. always, it will always stay there as darkness. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, also in the secret doctrine, Blavatsky said that darkness is darkness to us only because we do not have eyes to see. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. darkness is light. But because of our lacking, our incapacity, it seems to be us, it appears to us as darkness. Mm -hmm. And from that standpoint, when you describe the process as it is when this uh, vi negative or neti neti that mm -hmm. we take out everything mm -hmm. and we reach to something that is not uh, describable, mm -hmm. then to me it seems how can something that has been described as darkness, really, really darkness, how it can be known? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How it can be known in the sense that is that which we say that is darkness, is it only darkness to us, as Blavatsky said, does it seem to be that, that yeah. it is only darkness because we do not know, or up to that moment we do not understand? Yeah. Yes, so. that's, uh, that's important to, um, to explore. First, there is an absolute darkness, uh, uh, which is the parabrahman, the absolute, which Blavatsky says not even the logos, not even the conscious aspect, aspect of God knows that darkness. because. It's like saying, you know, the, the, the conscious aspect has to cease in order to become the darkness. There is no knowing in that sense. However, then that darkness is reflected in our consciousness, and the darkness always recedes with our, with our process of meditation. So what at first seems to be darkness and silence, when you dwell there, you start perceiving it's like if we turn the lights off, we won't see anything. But dwell in the darkness, and you start seeing some, some shapes. So you go always in the direction of the darkness. At first, your darkness may be here. Dwell there, and then you start perceiving things, subtle feelings, a, a pure sense of awareness. And then you, you realize there is a darkness behind that. So then, once you dwell enough on, on one level, you begin to like to realize I can I can leave this behind too, and go in the darkness that now receded to the next stage, let's say, and then you dwell there, and then you dwell enough, and the, it's like the darkness keeps receding. So darkness, Blavatsky says, is relative. You know, from the point of view of the logos, the absolute is darkness. From the point of view of manifestation, the logos is darkness, etc. So I think the reason why the mystics make emphasis on the darkness is because it always shows you the direction to go, not because it's a static principle. Well, again, thank you. Your talks are mm -hmm. always stimulating. And there was a, uh, a couple times in there, this might be following on what John said a little bit too, but there was one slide in particular where it, she was talking about the fourfold consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I know we tend to understand things in the, the context mm -hmm. that we're you know, we have the most background. Yeah. Um, and, and for me, as in John, that's probably Theravada Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I was hearing was, or seeing, was the four establishments of mindfulness. You know that sutra? The yeah, yeah, the, the four basis of yeah. mindfulness. Yeah. Right, so I, it seemed very similar. And yeah. the more it went, the more it got similar. And then on the next point, it, uh, the next slide, she was talking about the process. And it almost seemed like she was de describing the process of letting go into a, a jhana, into mm -hmm. an, an absorption state, mm -hmm, which again mm -hmm. is just classic uh, Buddhist teaching. Mm -hmm. And the, the, my, so my question really is, is there a correlation between um, 
between some of those mm -hmm. things and maybe yeah. some of those pra particular practices? Yeah. Yes, I think they are talking about the same, the, that the number four matches, I think, is just coincidence. But for example, this is an example in, 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 in the, the Sutra, the Buddha talks about these four levels of, per se, of uh, foundations for awareness. And what you normally find in Vipassana teachings tends to stay on the first level, watch sensations. Or perhaps, you know, watch emotions and thoughts. But in the, in the public teachings that we receive, hardly ever you find instructions as to how to go beyond the four foundations of attention. And you know, what is beyond? Because the highest foundation of attention, if I remember uh, correctly, is our consciousness of the objects, the consciousness that comes through the senses. Well, can you go beyond that and leave the four behind? And that is something that I'm sure that the, the Buddhist teachers or the Swamis, they teach to their disciples, but it's not uh, easily available in the West. So I think it's the same that Blavatsky was saying. Blavatsky was using fourfold in the sense of thoughts, emotions, the sense of vitality or, or, or being alive, and the physical sensations. Leave all that behind and go beyond. And, and you could interpret it in the same way, yeah. Hi, Pablo. Um, the talk was really good. Um, and there's a phenomenon that our eyes can do that you may wish to comment on and see if it's helpful at all, because I'm not so sure. But that in a light room or in outdoors in the sun, the way we want to see something is to look at it. OK? But people like hunters that live in the outdoors at night when there is the light is very, very dim. Mm -hmm. Instead, if you look at something, you're less likely to see it. And so what they teach you to do is to look next to things so that mm -hmm. then your eyes can pick things up. And it's just something that our eyes do. But I wonder if there's a correlate in any way. Yes, we have a peripheral perception. Castaneda, for example, sometimes would talk about that peripheral perception which may bring a different awareness. I mean, the sight is overpowering normally all the other senses. And sight is very related to concepts and to mental you know, consciousness. So relying more on, on this vague peripheral uh, perception may help you go to a more formless mind if you do it in the right way. Um, I never heard it in the connection of seeing things, but I'm sure that it works, and maybe you are stimulating some psychic perception. Now, the idea with, with the, the mystical approach, uh, the one that is not visionary, is to go beyond any kind of perception. You know, you go in meditation, and there is a sequence of colors that can be seen. Uh, but this, you, translate, you transcend the colors. Then there may be sounds that you can hear. You transcend the sounds. Is going, you know, both in Buddhism with all the jhanas, in Patanjali Yoga Sutra with the different samadhis. There, there are ex, um, description of what you see on the different levels or what kind of awareness is there. Uh, the idea in the mystical quest is to go to that one which, as Dionysius said, um, where you transcend heavenly, um, you know, sounds and utterances and. E even the, the subtle perceptions, you go beyond. You go to the darkness. And thank you, Pablo. Uh, as others have said, very inspiring and thought-provoking. <clears throat> I'm finding myself uh, thinking about uh, the equivalence of light and darkness and silence and sound. Um, darkness, in a sense, is silence, perhaps. Uh, light is uh, at least in part has a vibrational dimension to it, which is also found in the realm of sound. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure if I have a question or just I'm inviting your observation on the equivalence between light, darkness, uh, silence, silence, and sound. Yes, I, I think they correspond. Um, you know, for each each aspects of the absolute principle, we have the the unmanifested and the manifested aspects. So from silence, it would be sound. From darkness, it would be light. And we could draw different parallelisms. Uh, now, the idea, again, in, on this path is to move away from all the perceptions. So uh, you know, sometimes we, 
we hear the clock in meditation and it's a nuance. Then we hear an astral bell and we are excited. And it's just a sound. It's a psychic sound. And most mystics would say, for example, Christian mystics would say, um, if you have some psychic experience, this is Satan trying to lead you astray from the super essential darkness that is God. So that you get confused and amused by all these perceptions. Of course, the psychic realm has its own purpose. But in this approach, you try to transcend uh, physical or psychic impressions. Another that you're familiar with, Ramana Maharshi's teachings, mm -hmm. and he says that there's three ways to go to enlightenment, either for meditation, breath, and through vichara. Well, he says the first two are really unnecessary unless you can't get the third one. And when he talks about the third one, vichara, and the path of inquiry, and the question is, mm -hmm. the seminal question is always, who am I? Mm -hmm. And the answer is not of the mind, and the answer is not of the sensations. It's not of the body, it's not of the perception. The answer is the direct experience of who I am. And mm -hmm. so to me, that seems like that that's a simple process that transcends um, everything that is sensual and all knowledge and all planes and phenomena of, mm -hmm. and so forth. And I just wondered if is am I right with that mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. are you because this seems what we're talking about seems like a complicated thing as opposed to this really direct um, like we can let go of the mind instantaneously. We can only do it pre uh, presently and in the now. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, yes, as long as we do it in the right way. Uh, for example, Ramana says, you, you ask, ask yourself, who am I? No, there is a thought. So you ask yourself, uh, who is producing this thought? And then you say, me. And then you ask yourself, and who am I? And the question is not so much to find an answer, but it's a strategy to look inside. What Blavatsky said, you know, pin your, your awareness away from thoughts, emotions. Uh, Ramana does it through, by means of the question, who am I? And you just look at that sense of uh, I-ness that he called I-I, not I, Pablo, but the pure I-ness. Sometimes people say, who, uh, you know, where is this uh, thought coming from, from me, and who is the thinker? And that is a wrong question, because who is the thinker? When you look at that, there is a duality between you looking at the thinker or you looking at the I. What he tries is you looking at the observer itself. And that is not that easy. Uh, so we have to, you know, with experience, we may di discover that difference. But if you can use the thoughts to turn your attention on the pure sense of fineness, that is another way of accessing it. You can access it, you know, as Blavatsky says, by sheer willpower. You just pin your, your consciousness beyond thoughts. You can access it, as Bess and Ledbitter say, you go through meditation when your mind is focused and is stable, drop everything. Or you can use that question. Or you can just nakedly watch the sense of I amness. There are different ways of doing it. And all of them have their pitfalls, their difficulties, their good you know, uh, helps. So uh, adding to uh, the comment about darkness equivalent to silence, there's a, a meditation where you hear a bell, and you're focused on the bell. And the sound disappears, but you maintain the focus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a it's a, a a help to try to stay in that state of attention uh, that Annie Besant was describing. Yes. Uh, 